Hello and welcome to the panel at Dublin BIC. Today is Thursday the 9th of July and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a very old friend of mine, Piero Tintori, founder and CEO of Terminal 4. Piero, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I, yeah, it's absolutely, it feels like the Graham Norton show or something like that. It's, I'm very, very excited to be here. It's, uh, it, no, I'm very, very happy to chat to you today. Very good. Uh, Piero, uh, professionally speaking, you and I have moved in the same circles or we were moving in the same circles so, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, back then, Terminal 4, um, I would have known it as a content management system. And I know that you were focusing on the third level sector universities. Uh, today, you are the content management system for some tens of thousands of uh, university websites. Uh, you have hundreds of third level clients. You have tens of thousands of users. Uh, but I know that uh, today, uh, you're so much uh, more than a content management system. So could you bring us up to date, please, uh, with uh, Terminal 4? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's been an interesting journey. I guess back to the old days uh, when we when our paths crossed many a time. Um, but, uh, back in the earlier days, the internet. Like, I mean, obviously we were doing a bit of everything. But I suppose about uh, four or five years ago, um, maybe a little bit more, was involved in the the leadership for growth program um, with Enterprise Ireland. And a big thing that came out of that fantastic program was the whole idea of you know getting a really clear strategy. And at that point we very much decided let's not be web content management for everybody in the world, right? There's going to be lots of competitors, open source and not otherwise. We said, let's, we actually had quite a lot about at the time, about 60 universities and colleges that we worked with. And we said, look, you know what, we really can, it's an area we love working with, uh, very nice people. And there's also a social element that we can help people, them have a, students have a better experience trying to find the right universities, colleges, and so on that they want to work with. So what we did from there is we've been, uh, from that point, we, we, we focused on, as you said, to work with well over 200 universities around the world in about 10 or 11 key countries that we operate in. Um, but what we've been doing over the last two years, um, of which we really activated the strategy last year, was we've been trying to build out a whole set of products, like a portfolio of products that really help universities and colleges in one of two ways. One is ultimately, can we help the student experience? So that's everything from helping the uh, student find the right course to do, study and so on. If it, there may be already a student, can they have a good experience to do self-service stuff online with the university? Um, but then also for the universities, there's great opportunities to, to really streamline and transform how they work digitally. Um, and that's what that was the strategy we activated last year. And it's we've now got a small portfolio of solutions that we're now selling so into a university, we might have one product and then we can sell the next and keep adding to that. So although it's a very, very defined market, it's not like there's extra universities being added on every year um, in many countries. What we're able to do now is actually grow through actually selling more products into the same university. So, yeah, that's our story. We have about 70 something people, um, mainly in Dublin but spread around from sort of the US, Australia, um, Poland, Spain, um, parts of Ireland, and I suppose these days uh, from an attic or under the stairs uh, somewhere um, around Ireland anyway in people's homes. But uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of where we've got to so far. Fantastic and congratulations. Um, uh, I'm very interested to hear you say that a relatively short time ago in the overall life of Terminal 4, about five years ago, you made that decision to really, really focus on the third level sector. Uh, and inevitably, that means that you're making a decision to say no uh, to some uh, customers yeah. or to some future prospective customers. And that can be an extraordinarily difficult thing for uh, you know, a small or medium-sized business to do, uh, to actually make a decision to turn away revenue. Um, can you tell us about how you rationalize that in Terminal 4? 
Yeah, it was a very nervous moment. Uh, like, I suppose for everybody, I suppose including our investors and, you know, you're sort of like you are staying super focused because, you know, for so many years, and I'm sure people do it now when they're doing their pitch, you only have to watch Dragon's Den or any of these and they go, you know, our market is the world. And it's like, you know, what's the market size? Oh, it's about 50 billion, you know? <laughs> and, and you go, okay, well, like capability wise, what's our capability to win a really decent amount of that? So it was very nerve wracking, you know, but what ended up happening was we were doing, we were going through the whole strategy um, process and we, we did go wide. We decided to look at all these other areas that we could actually, other markets that we could adapt or sell our product into. And it was actually one of the days when we, we, we'd finished that. We were just like, you know, nothing was really exciting us. Um, and then, um, our, our, one of our company mentors was uh, you know, had had headed off, and we were just having a bit of a chat afterwards. And then we suddenly realised actually we're we're really really strong in this area, and I think we're underestimating how strong we were in higher education. But but you're right, it's a big leap because then you sort of are saying it's very narrow. Looking back on it, so we were very nervous about taking that leap. We sort of played it a little bit cautiously for a while, in that we were just putting the feelers out there to see how this would, what would the reaction in the marketplace be? What we do have a rule is that if, a, if an organization contacts us that is not in higher education, if they contact us and the product is still a good fit, you know, we'll potentially do business with them, uh, but we don't actively go out and sell to other markets. Um, and, you know, actually recently we've gone live with a huge project for the city of Minneapolis, which is not higher ed, but they approached us for many reasons and uh, it's been a good fit. So the big thing, though, for us, the benefits, though, looking back on it have just been really massive. But it's taking that leap is is just really difficult, uh, particularly because all your other uh, the, all the other parties like your investors and everybody, it's like they want global domination. Right. But actually, we found well, we can get global domination with our capability in one market. So looking back on it, what's worked? One, it means your marketing and your communications is just super focused. You know, when we go in and talk, even our website, um, which we just recently launched earlier on this week, relaunched, uh, it's just super focused. We're able to say, okay, we know you're a university visiting our website. Here's how we can help you as a university. So we can focus on, do you work in student recruitment? Do you work in IT? Do you work um, in marketing and communications? And we can really strongly get across the benefits of our solution. The second thing is when we go in and present, we can talk the talk to a, to a such an extreme level that it's like, they know that we know their sector and we know how they are very different. Um, that's been really positive as well. It also means that the, the customer market, uh, the product market fit, we can get that perfect because we can integrate, for example, with tools that are only used in higher education. The one thing that's been actually we didn't expect that's been quite interesting is because of the dynamics of the higher education market, it actually also scares away competitors. So we've had big companies um, like, you know, NASDAQ and uh, uh, Wall Street listed companies that have actually decided not to compete with us in our space because, and we've heard because it's when they've come in and tried to sell, you know, they're like one of our competitors when they showed um, a whole sort of online experience. They were using this sample camera shop website, and like, how has that got anything to do with um, anything to do with the challenges that universities have? Okay. So, what it's also meant is that it's pushed them out a bit. You know, they've sort of said, "Ah, look, you know, it's a long sales cycle. There's complexities, and they weren't winning business. We were beating some of these multi-billion-dollar companies um, for work, and uh, that was one of the unforeseen benefits of it all. 
Fantastic. There's some extraordinarily valuable lessons there for uh, every startup, every client of Dublin BIC. Uh, by focusing on a particular uh, niche sector, you're able to double down on the product market fit. You're able to get your marketing communication so focused. And by the way, I looked at your, your website that you've just launched. It looks amazing. But hey, if Terminal 4 can't produce a good website, who can? Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> but, uh, I love to say I designed it myself. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a, a great team around us, I guess. Um, it does look Look superb and of course anybody from the higher education sector going into it would see yes immediately this is the company that I, I want to work with and then that's a great point you made you can actually scare off huge global corporations uh, and and uh, do better than uh, than than just uh, compete against them you can actually beat them uh, which is superb and that that's um and, and, and that can be true of many relatively small, early startup, really innovative companies if they just focus on a, on a particular niche. So it's well, they also they can move quicker, right? And yeah. if you're moving quicker and very market focused, these companies are trying to focus on so many markets. We all know how it ends up being just very hard for them to change course. So there is those opportunities to really dominate in a very, very neat, I think niche seemed to be sort of like historically a bit of a bad word in sort of entrepreneurial circles, you know, oh, you're niche, you know, um, and it's like, okay, but actually I want to be niche and I want to really, you know, you only have to look at some amazingly successful companies like Finergo and, um, and others who are just so focused on a particular market and they yep. ace it completely yep. um and and they're not small you know they've been able to really become very very big companies so piero um you're uh, it's an extraordinarily interesting time to be selling uh, digital media solutions into the third level sector with everything that's going on there everything moving online um, but I'd like to talk to you about selling into a very specific sector like uh, the th third level university sector. It's one that would have a reputation uh, for having very long sales cycles. Um, we've come across this with other clients. We'd have clients also selling into uh, the medical sector, which would have a similar reputation for very long sales cycles. Um, can you tell us, uh, for a small or medium-sized organization such as Terminal 4, um, how do you manage and sustain yourself for selling into a, a channel that has those long sales cycles? Yeah, I mean, it is a very tough one. I would say it's actually probably the toughest things for companies. And, and I often talk to people who are trying to look at getting uh, moving into selling into higher education i think there is there's two things uh, there's two perceptions of the market one of them is correct and one of them is not the first one which you've talked about is the long sales cycle that's definitely correct uh, and i'll come back to the moment the other one is that there's a perception that it's a small market like you go like i've heard oh they don't have a lot of money you know and it's actually it's not like we work with the university of florida um uh, down in Gainesville and they are like a multi-billion dollar organization you know and there's and to give you an idea there's 4,000 um, four-year accredited um, institutions in the U.S. of which there's okay there's a lot of small ones but you probably get about 12 to 1300 of a decent sized university and many none of us have, would have ever have heard of before uh, for working in the market so there's definitely there's definitely business to be done with these organizations the sales cycle is tricky right that is very very tricky and it's i think what it's almost if i was to say to a company now trying to get into the sector you have to be patient and obviously the patience will link in with cash flow because it's not going to be like projects they can happen and they can happen quickly but also they can be just things can get delayed it could be delayed for like two or three months so you wouldn't want to be in a position where you're you're very dependent on oh, well i need that to come in next month to pay the bills for you know. for the uninitiated what what could a sales cycle duration be well like we've so on our traditional product, which is it came out the web content management and digital engagement product, like we could be talking to people for 12 months, two years, 
you know? Two years. Yeah, you could be, but ultimately, or they might have a competitive product in and you're waiting for it to come out, to, to come back, um, for them to come out a contract on us and replace us or something like that. But the, the upside of it is, is that you get, if you do good work with them, you get amazing retention. Like, Oh, we've done statistics on our churn rate and like we've shown it, them to people and they're like, nah, there's something wrong with your maths on that. Like, that's just ridiculous. So you, if you have the patience to win the clients and do good work, it will pay off for a very, very long time uh, with them. But that's a challenge, you know, for organizations trying to build in. So for us, what we've done is, is twofold. Is, is that we're, we've built up over time a very big head of steam. So we have a lot of opportunities that are on the go um, all of the time. Um, so that when things, if people's priorities change, you know, we'll always have, there's always be a good pattern of deals coming in. Some might speed up, some might slow down, but if you have a big enough pool, but to do that, you have to have sales team, but also a sales team that are patient you know, because I think where selling into this market can be tough because you could hire a salesperson. It would be wrong to expect them to get a return. Like, I want to see your numbers in three months time. If you've not sold a deal, you're not here. You know, it's not like that. It's about long-term relationships from that point of view. So it's tough. It's, it's very, very tough. But that said, there higher education isn't just the universities that we know the names of. There's so many different sizes um, of organizations. There's many different appetites for new solutions uh, and so on. So I think it's about, I would say is get somebody involved who understands the market very, very well to help you design your sales strategy and your playbook. And even if you have salespeople who have already sold to higher education, that can really help you along. But just don't be banking on, well, I'm going to go to market. Um, unless it's something, for example, that's right now helping, you, you know, can, can help them work in a, in a, in a, in a um, you know, in, a, in the pandemic situation, it's probably going to be about building long-term relationships. You know, these people are, you know, they want to choose solutions that will work well for them. Um, and, and all of that certainly requires the right salespeople with the right incentivization uh, systems and, as you say, patience. Yeah, exactly that. And, but it is, look, it's a great market to work with. The people that we've worked with are just, I, I know it's easy to say, you know, maybe everybody's market, but they're just genuinely the majority, almost everybody we work with is just so, so nice and so interested and in actually, I suppose there's a social element to education, right? Um, and yeah, and I suppose it attracts people who are really just nice people to work with. So um, I suppose that's what gives us a bit of joy as well is that it's, uh, you know, keeps us happy and we like helping them. Does Terminal 4 have a position on the perennial matter of free pilots? It's yeah, we don't. Uh, so we have so we've built been building out our portfolio, as I mentioned, around uh, different products um, and our traditional product. It's it can deliver. a lot. It's so basically we help universities um, run their websites and their get their websites to work better for them. With that, there is a sort of a piece where getting the value out of it is we is part of the the, the wisdom we've built up internally over many years so in those cases we used to be asked for sandboxes and we used to provide them for people to play around with but actually that's sort of died away quite a lot recently because I think people are realizing there's lots of different systems out there in many markets but actually it's how it's implemented is probably uh, going to be the benefit and uh, we have a new uh, e-assessment product that we've launching there we've been doing small little trials mainly to get feedback and buy-in and people just what we're finding is people just want to quickly see that it exists but actually they're not going into too much detail on pilots even from our own purchasing of software, I think there is just a validation of like, well, is the quality of the product there? I think many years ago we used to find, I think it's probably changed to many years ago. Um, I, I wouldn't be pro very long pilots or anything like, or very long. I think you can end up just sort of like getting a login and never really 
getting to the level of depth into a solution. Um, Very good. Um, another topic you, you mentioned earlier on, um, a leadership program you've done with Enterprise Ireland, um, the enterprise support ecosystem uh, here in, in Ireland. Um, how would you describe that and any particular um, uh, recommendations you'd make uh, yeah, to yeah. founders, CEOs coming up a few years behind you? Yeah, I mean, look, when we started off, like I suppose a lot of the Enterprise Ireland and other supports uh, weren't really there. They were just probably in their um, early stages. But I think the strategy that they've taken is just super. And it's way ahead. What even I've talked to other entrepreneurs in other countries. Um, for me, uh, the one regret I have is that I, I you know, um, people were saying to me, look, you know, you should sign up for the Leadership for Growth probably about a year or two before I actually did. And I kept sort of having the excuse of, oh, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. But actually now, if I'd gone back, if I could go back and tell myself, like you're actually, the reason you're so busy is because you're not thinking in the right strategic way. And um, that's been just super for us. And um, we've uh, done the, um, been involved in the innovation for growth last year, which our new product has come out of, and that's been super. I would just say, look, all of these courses, training that you can get, it's easy to go, I'm too busy. You know, my phone's hopping all day, but actually the benefit in the long run out of them is just so valuable for us that it's really helped us. Um, and also I'd say tap into like the local Enterprise Ireland um, offices, you know, nothing, not necessarily asking them for anything official, but just like bouncing, getting a feel for what's going on in the local market, the economy, that's been helpful before we've gone in and done sales pitches to understand well, what are the concerns? What are the things in the newspapers that are getting people worried? Um, or maybe things you could help with. Um, yeah, all of those things are just super. I mean, the only thing that sort of, I suppose frustrates me with some of the programs is, you know, these sort of Brexit assistance and uh, um, the pandemic assistant things. Um, that they involve so much paperwork and actually the number of companies that are actually getting them is just so small. That's quite frustrating, I think, and it's nothing to do with the government. I think it's probably linked back to the banks and their agenda. Um, but I think there's a problem around that. I think you'd be better off saying, don't bother applying for it because you're not going to get it rather than actually wasting time. But so my, my, my short uh, takeaway is for people who have their own companies is take on board any of these training programs in particular these accelerators these the leadership for growth and so on they are just like they are top-notch um programs that like normally we wouldn't have access to i think the cost to do the leadership for growth program if you weren't to do it through enterprise r and certainly when i did it in the we i did it in imd in switzerland and the equivalent they did a course which wasn't quite the same was like three or four times the cost and if i had said no look i wouldn't even be worried about the cost i wouldn't i would have done it two years earlier and i think we would have got a lot more out of it and particularly it brought in a lot of like it's not just strategy it's culture it's you know also even myself as a person i think i got a lot out of it well, on that subject, on my last question to you, Piero, um, Terminal 4 has been going from strength to strength for 20 years. I'm sure there's been ups and downs along the way. Uh, and uh, all that time you've been founder and CEO. Uh, what's your top tip for sustaining yourself as an entrepreneur for the, the long haul? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. It's, it's a really good question. I think for me, look, I, I get the, what I just talked about there about education and investing in yourself, I think is just so key. And I think I underestimated that before. For me, the big thing is like, I need to be, and I think any entrepreneurs, you have to be excited and happy about what you're doing, right? And I think that energy then, it gives, whatever, if you're excited about what you're doing, that energy then flows into, you know, your positivity about the business and, and so on. Look, I, I would say the big thing that, and, and for us, that's been about having a strategy that I can really buy into. So for at the moment, the strategy, we have this new product around, um, we have been around 20 years doing this, right? But actually it's been many phases. So it doesn't feel like I'm in, in the same job for 20 years. So like at the moment from the Innovation for Growth program, we've uh, designed and built a solution that happens to be incredibly timely right now 
for the universities, which is helping them do exams and invigilate those exams remotely from anywhere in the world. And that is so exciting. We've got like a contract we're signing with a big uh, Canadian university, which will be probably allow them to run hundreds of thousands of exams a year. Um, that sort of stuff, that, that, that's exciting, right? And then we've got all of the stuff behind that, that gets me going um so yeah i think it's it's making sure that you're so you're still bought into the strategy that you're excited on a monday morning that it's not because i think that negativity or if you're you're not happy with it it's going to be it's going to drag you down but then of course look that the other thing is you need to have you need to be able to have time for yourself to think and you know whether it's running or doing some exercise or getting your head out of the i think it's so easy to be stuck in the day to day that you need your headspace to be able to think about stuff because running your own business is really tough you know because you really have very very few people to there's a couple of things i would say if we're to end on a couple of little um sort of takeaways right for for entrepreneurs to be able to sustain themselves i would say obviously have other outlets other than work secondly invest in yourself and don't worry, you know, even spend money on training. Don't let it be that the training budget, if you have any, is spent on others. You need to spend it on yourself. Um, I, I would say is like you need to, I would say is if you can get like a mentor or somebody who can, you can bounce it off. Um, I'm involved in an organization as well called the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, eonetwork.org is the web address. And they have an Irish um chapter and we meet up with i meet up with like seven other uh, ceos every month um and it's just great for the head to be able to in a very confidential environment bounce ideas get you know even tricky situations i think having that network is really good of people who you can trust because otherwise the stuff just builds up in your head and you just it, it's it can be too much um yet those are probably my quick takeaways because it is it is stressful to run um your own company as you know in the past as well it is it's Absolutely. not it's not easy and it's not stuff that you can often talk to your family and friends around it's just not the things you'd want to mention not sure. in a negative way they just it, they don't understand the same challenges so i'd oh. say good supports like that are a very positive thing Piero, I'm confident that uh, Terminal 4 and yourself will be sustaining yourself uh, for quite a, a bit uh, longer. In fact, I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely expecting you to uh, go on to uh, a, a new trajectory uh, with everything that's happening in the third level sector. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about uh, Terminal 4 and yourself. So uh, listen, thank you very much for your time on the, the panel at Dublin here. BIC. And I uh, hope we speak again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Very, very happy to be. And if anybody wants to ever reach out to me, uh, trying to get into the sector, always happy to chat and support people. So yeah, thank you very much for having me on today as well. Really appreciate it. That's a very it. kind offer, Piero. Thank you. Bye now.